<laughs> Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 4, in a message entitled, Obey the Law. We are a nation of laws, and quite honestly, sometimes we got too many laws. I don't think anyone even knows all the laws that we have in this country. And perhaps we even uh, fancy ourselves uh, to be law-abiding citizens, maybe some of us more, maybe some a little less. But we even hear sometimes arguments about man's law versus what they call natural law. That sometimes you hear argued at the Supreme Court. But if you're a Christian this morning, you've been born again by the Spirit of God, then you actually have the freedom to choose what law you're going to obey. Now, it doesn't work exactly that way, uh, because I can't use that rationale uh, when I've been pulled over for speeding. Because uh, I could say, gee, you know, I just chose not to obey that law, and I don't have to if I don't want to. Um, but that's not exactly what I mean. It, but we do have a choice about obeying the laws, and our choices are going to lead us to walking with the Lord in freedom and in victory, spiritually, or walking daily in struggle and in shame. So what kind of law or what law are you and I going to obey? And our passage this morning in Romans chapter 8 gives us a choice as to what we want to obey. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. Let's read that. And as usual, I'm reading out of the New King James Version if my uh, version differs from the one that you have. The Bibles that you have underneath your chairs, if you need one, go ahead and take that one. But that's New King James too. This is what it says. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, that it was weak through the flesh, God did, by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Okay, so, what does that mean? Now, as a Christian, if you're a Christian this morning, I am no longer under condemnation from God. Everybody say amen. 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 No longer under condemnation of, from God. And what that means is by faith in Jesus... <laughs> By placing my faith in Jesus for who He is and what He did for me on the cross and His subsequent resurrection from the dead, that means I am now set free from the eternal penalty of the sins that I've committed, my violations of God's law. Now that's a great cause for celebration and we're just thrilled out of our minds that we don't have to pay the eternal price doesn't mean we won't pay a price here on earth. Like I like to say sometimes, you know, you can be really, really sorry that you robbed that bank, but you're still going to prison. So it doesn't mean we're going to escape all the consequences of the things that we do, but it does mean that eternally, when we stand before God in the day of judgment, we will not have to pay that price eternally for what we've done. But, as much as we can celebrate that, and we think, hallelujah, you know, I've done so many stupid things in my life, and I'm not going to have to pay the price for that eternally, even though I've certainly paid a price here on earth. But that's nice to know. That's good to know. I'm glad that we've got that waiting for us on the other side, but I still have to live this life, right? I still got to get through this world. And this is not always that much fun. So how then do I live? How then do I live? Knowing that I've got that tucked away, that, I, that I'm going to heaven when I die, that Jesus promises when I place my faith and trust in Him, that I have the certainty, the certainty of going to heaven to be with Him when I die. But I still got to navigate through the rest of this life. How, how, how do I do that? How do I live this life? And, and what will I live for? Why? What's my motivation? You know, what What do I have? You know, okay, I've got that waiting for me, but what about the rest of my life here? What is my motivation for getting up every day? What is my motivation for carrying on every day? Well, 
First and foremost, of course, because of what Jesus has done for me. Simply because of what He has done for me, that He would come to this world, live as a human, live a sinless life, and yet die a sinner's death to pay the price that I owe for my violations of that alone. That's enough to get me up and get me going every day and want to do things His way. I have a heartfelt desire to live a life that is pleasing to Him because of what He's done for me. That's just gratitude. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, If you love me, you will obey what I command. So that our motivation is simply love for Jesus. And perhaps most importantly, and you've heard me talk about this, and we're going to dig into this a little bit this morning, is that He enables me to live for Him. He enables me to live for Him. I mean, sometimes, you know, you look at the law, just the laws, all of those 613 different commandments, and remember, Rich is going through the Ten Commandments on Thursday night. You should be here listening to those messages about what the Ten Commandments are and what they mean to us. We look at those laws and we think, you know, I can't do that. I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, I can't. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, you know, walking up to a baby in a, in a, in a stroller or a crib or whatever and saying, what's wrong with you? Get up and start running. <laughs> Get up out of that stroller and run, you <clears throat> Not. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Well, I, you know what? Dumb is that to say to a child, you got, well, but if we waited till that child grew and we assisted that child in their growth and we taught that child how to walk and then how to run, then maybe later at some point in life we could say to them, run. And they go, yeah. <laughs> I can do that. See, Jesus doesn't just tell us what to do. He enables us from within, by the power of His Spirit, to do what He commands us to do. So now, when Jesus commands us to do something, we can look at it and we can say, I can do that, because He will do it in me and through me. It's not just me doing it. I know I'm rushing ahead of myself just a little bit, but it's important to know. He doesn't command me and then leave me to fight it out all on my own. Sometimes that's the way that we treat God's commandments. He tells us what to do, and then he just leaves us there and says, you know, good luck, suckers. I hope you can figure that one out. You know, I mean, he, God doesn't do that to us. So then, as a Christian, what are my choices? And, and it doesn't really seem like much of a choice, but I'm just saying that for the sake of this message. Here's our choice. The law of the Spirit or the law of <coughs> sin and death. You choose. What's it going to be? Door number one? The law of the Spirit, freedom in Christ. Door number two, the law of sin and death. <laughs> Is there a door number three? <laughs> okay, let's talk about this. The law of the Spirit, verses one and two. Okay, we know that there's no condemnation. We're reminded that the life of a Christian uh, also is a walk. Look at that in verse 1. Who do not walk according to the Spirit, or according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Good to know. We've got no condemnation. Good to know also. Here's our instructions. It's a walk. God's telling us what our life is going to be like here on earth with Him. Walk. 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 Not a run. Not a sprint. Not a, even necessarily a triathlon. It's a walk. That means one foot in front of the other, step by step. And quite honestly, in the course of your Christian life, certainly in my Christian life too, there have been days when that's all I could do. That was the most I could do, was just keep putting one foot in front of the other. I didn't feel like anything else. I didn't feel like I had the strength to do that. But if I keep putting one foot in front of the other, I know that I'm moving forward. And you guys, Amen, you, you know me well enough to know I'm a big fan of forward movement. <laughs> Not a big fan of sitting still in the, in the spiritual life, in the Christian life. Because if you're in a, in a fight, and we are, if you're in a fight, you make an easy target if you just stand still. But if you keep moving forward, then I know I'm going in the direction that the Lord wants me to go. So it's, it's a step-by-step. Now, I wish the Christian life 
was a supersonic flight straight to heaven. You, you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and zoom, you're right into heaven, and we get to skip over all of the rest of this uh, life stuff on earth. Well, it's, it's not like that. We're here now. This is what we've got to do. So this is what we're going to do, right? Amen. This is what we got to do, so this is what we're going to do. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 tells us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we've been called. Jesus called us. Jesus saved us. We're called by His name, Christians. Now walk in a manner worthy of that name. So that when we're out there in the world, people understand what a Christian really is. Quite honestly, sometimes we are God's worst advertising. You know, people think, well, if that's what a Christian is, well, I don't want to be one then. Well, let's go out there and show them what a Christian is properly. Someone who's walking in a manner worthy of the calling with which we are called. But this sometimes is where we get a little confused because some think that being a Christian means, well, now I've got this whole new set of rules and regulations that I have to obey. That's what the Bible is, right? Do's and don'ts, right? That's all that it is. Do's and don'ts, well, not really. Jesus boiled down his law all of his laws, down to two. Just two. Not ten, not 613, just two. In Mark chapter 12, verse 30 to 31, when he was asked about this, he says, love the Lord your God mm -hmm. with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Mary John Corson put it like this, and I think this is true. He said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then do whatever you want. Because if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you will do what is pleasing to Him. Amen. You'll do naturally what is best for Him. And, and really, honestly, we talk about living a life that's pleasing to God and we think that we have to please Him, otherwise He's mad at us. But what we need to understand is a life that is pleasing to Him is the best life that you could ever possibly live. Mm -hmm. It's what is best for you. Amen. You want to be the person that God made you to be? The person that God created you to be? Do you want to be you, the real you, the proper you, the correct you, all you, the you that God created? Then live a life that is pleasing to Him, and you will be that person, the person that God created you to be. Now, let's clarify something here, this, this word law, law. Because I know what I think of when I think law. Law means I can't drive more than 65 miles an hour on the 280 freeway. Now, we can argue the morality of a law like that. <laughs> that they would restrict someone as skillful as me behind the wheel. Only 65 miles an hour. So we look at the law and we think, well, it's a rule. It's a rule, right? And, and that's true. The, the word law here that's used here in Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 1 and 2, it means a rule, a command, or an influence. That's important. A, a rule, a command, or an influence. And in this case, it's the influence that the spirit of life produces in us. Think about that. That exerts a control, which is here called a law, for a law often means anything by which we are ruled or governed. So what is the governing influence of your life? What governs your life? When you go out in the great big bad world that's out there, and you do the things that you do, and you think the things that you think, and, and you go to work, and you go to school, or you're looking for a job, or you're in a relationship with someone, or you're not in a relationship with someone, what is the governing influence of your life? Well, here in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, it's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus <coughs> that has set me free. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's what is to be our controlling influence. So then, what is the governing influence of your life? Now, it might be your desires. That's the governing influence of your life. It could be your goals, your aspirations, your plan. Well, the governing influence of my life is I'm going to follow my heart. I'm going to follow my heart. I'm going to be true to myself. And, you know, and I hear all of those things and I think, what, what, what does that even mean? 
Follow my heart? If I followed my heart, I'd be dead now. Honestly. It, it, I mean, if I, if I did, if it, just do it. Just do it. You know, Nike, if, if, if I just did it, I would have just been dead. I, I never would have been standing where I am right now. Just follow my heart. Just be true to myself. If I'm true to myself, that makes me a liar. I mean, I, I don't even know what that means. What is the governing influence of your life? What governs your life? What governs your actions and your reactions and your ideas and your dreams and your aspirations and your goals? What governs those things? Because I can stand here right now and I can say, well, gee, you know, I would love more than anything else in my life to be an astronaut. I just want to be an astronaut so much. But honestly, honestly, what is the, what is the probability of me ever becoming an astronaut? It's, it's right around zero or less. <laughs> so if that's the governing aspiration and, or law of my life to be an astronaut, you know, maybe I'm just kind of aiming in the wrong place in the wrong way. What's my goal? What's my aspiration? Now, I, I can only tell you this. I can only tell you what God's Word says. Because I know one thing that God's Word said, and we're going to get to it here soon, is that God's goal in your life is to mold you and shape you into the image of Christ. That's what He's doing. He's expressed that. As we're, going to, we're going to get to it here in Romans chapter 8. God is going to mold you and shape you into the image of His Son. What all does that mean? He's going to change your character going to change your mind. He's going to transform you and me. Now, transforming into the image of the Son doesn't mean we're all going to look like Jesus outwardly. You know, we're all going to get that kind of surfer look, you know, the long wavy brown hair with the beard and, you know, the popular images of, of Jesus. I can't wait to see him because I think he's going to blow us away because I don't think he's going to look like anything that anybody thought that he looked like. I think we're going to be amazed at how normal he actually looks. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, 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 exactly what's normal. What's normal. But the fact is, is God's going to transform you into that character. The character that he made you to be, the character of his son. Now, none of your goals, none of your aspirations, none of your plans, none of your desires impart to you the power to do that. Just because I want to be an astronaut doesn't mean now I have the power or the ability to be an astronaut. But if I say I want to be the person that God made me to be, now there's something that God will empower and God will enable. Because He is not going to empower or, ena or enable anything that He doesn't plan for your life. So you want to be an astronaut all you want. But if that's not God's will or God's plan for your life, you're not going to have the power to do that. On the other hand, if that is what God wants to do in your life, then there's not much you can do to stop it. And I recommend don't even try. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of years hearing in the back of my mind the call to the ministry. And I dug my heels in so hard. And I resisted it. So I think, honestly, I think I wasted a lot of years that I could have been pastoring. And I just wasted those years because I just dug my heels and I just didn't want to do what God wanted me to do. Because He was asking me to do something that I just, I, I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. Lord, don't, don't make me, and you know what? After a while, when I finally gave up and said, okay, Lord, you know, I'll, I'll do what you want me to do. You know what happened after that? There was nothing else in life that I wanted to do. I, I was willing to drop anything and everything because all of a sudden now, when I gave up the struggle, now I wanted to do what God wanted me to do and what He was calling me to do. I dug my heels in for all of those years for no reason at all. When in fact I could have been doing what the Lord, you know, I don't look back on regret. It's just what the Lord did in my life and it's how I struggled against it. But the fact remains is when we give up the fight, and when we do what the Lord wants us to do, man, everything gets so much easier. Hallelujah. Now this world, that is a hallelujah, this world that we live in, it's, it's full of books and videos and programs and websites that will tell you how to achieve your wildest dreams, how to make money and be successful and be taller, thinner, younger, and richer. And You know, you can find something that will tell you all of that. But uh, none of that is going to fill you with the power to walk with Jesus. And that's what we want to do. We just want to walk with Jesus. 
be the people that he wants us to be. Show the world what it means to be a Christian. So, how should I see this law? Okay, let me give you a couple of sub-things to think about. What this law can do for you. The law of the Spirit. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus that has set me free. Well, that's the first thing that it can do for me. What this law can do for me is it can set me free. It can set me free. Now, I just told you about digging in your heels and resisting the Lord. It's the same thing with walking in obedience to God. When we're walking in disobedience to God, everything is just really laborious. I love that word, too, because it sounds like what it is, laborious. In James chapter 1, verse 25, God's word says, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, that's another name for what we're talking about, the perfect law of liberty. That sounds good. Liberty and justice for all. Um, but he looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. It's like when we align ourselves with God's word and doing what God wants us to do, everything just gets a little easier. Now, I'm not saying that everything gets easy. I'm saying things get easier. And there's less uh, conflict in my life because the first person I come in conflict with when I sin is the Lord himself. And I don't want to be in conflict with him. The law of liberty, it means that I am free now. I am free to live the life that God wants me to live. And that's where the greatest freedom is. One of my favorite passages from Psalm 119, verse 32, and I'm quoting the New International Version, which gets it the best. Psalm 119, verse 32, I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. Amen. Doesn't that sound great? I run in the path of your commands. You almost get this visual image of, you know, running through the field of daisies and it's a bright sunny day and the birds are chirping and life is beautiful, the sky is blue and, and you think, I'm running in the path of the Lord's commands because He set my heart free. And the greatest freedom of all is always going to be doing what God tells you to do. Always. You dig in your heels, you do what you want to do, not what God wants you to do, boy, it's just nothing but trouble every time. God will empower you to obey when your desire is to obey. If you want to do what God wants you to do, He's going to give you the power. He's going to give you the strength to be able to do it. That walk with Him, <coughs> empowered by Him, doing what He wants you to do, that will in turn transform your entire life. Your life will be transformed. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says we're going to be a new creation in Christ. Old things passed away. All things have become new. I love the sound of that. Romans chapter 12 verse 2, the latter part, or the beginning of verse 2, that we will be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And I can tell you, as I get older, my mind needs more and more renewing every single day. As a matter of fact, quite honestly, I think I've told you this, for what I would love to be able to have is a, is a good brainwashing. I, I would love to be able to flush the handle and get rid of some of the stuff that I've stored up in there over the years. I want to press disc defrag. And I would like to clear out those sectors that are no longer any good. And there's a lot of sectors that aren't any good anymore in here. I'd love to be able to do that. And God's word promises that a life of obedience in Him, with a heart and a mind that's drenched, marinated in God's word, is going to be a, a mind that is transformed, a, a, a mind that is renewed. And I need my mind renewed. Jesus told His disciples, don't leave this town. This was right before He ascended back into heaven after His resurrection. He said, don't leave town until the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That was Luke chapter 24, verse 49. The fact is, is you and I cannot do what He wants us to do apart from His power. That's what the law can do for you. Okay, what this law of the, of the Spirit of, of truth, of, of the Spirit of Jesus, this freedom that we're talking about, what can this law not do for you? What can't it do for you? Okay, well, it can't force you to obey. Okay, there's no coercion here. God doesn't say, you have to obey or else. 
I'm going to squish you like a bug. I know there's people that think of God that way. That if you, if you don't obey God, He's going to come down here and He's just going to pound you. And quite honestly, I, I think if, if that's the way that you think of God, you certainly got a misconception of God, but perhaps you might want to look a little bit into your childhood and see the relationship that you had with your earthly father. Because you'll find the roots of that there. I, I, I know I've mentioned this to you before, I, and I talked with a, a client of mine about this, and she was having a struggle, and then saying, oh, you know, God's just, he's, he's not going to forgive me, God's just going to, he's going to take me out to the woodshed, you know. And I said, no, no, I said, your Heavenly Father loves you. He loves you. No, 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 he's going to beat me, he's done with me. And I said, no, no, your Heavenly Father loves you. And that's when the light bulb came on in my head. And I asked her, hey, what was your relationship like with your dad? She said, oh, he was an alcoholic, he used to beat mom and beat us kids and everything. And I thought, there it is. Because I used the word father, and that's what clicked in her head. Because your heavenly father is not like your earthly father. Your heavenly father doesn't behave like your earthly father. Maybe your earthly father deserted you. Maybe he beat you. Maybe he yelled at you or screamed at you or, or shamed you. Or <coughs> Maybe he did all of those. Your heavenly father doesn't do that. Earthly father might have done that. Not your heavenly father. So this law, this law is not going to force you to obey. Uh, again, John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. So he doesn't put any coercion on there. He doesn't say, if you don't do what I command, I'm going to beat the living daylights out of you. He doesn't say that. He said, just love me. And if you love me, you'll do what I command. Simple, isn't it? doesn't make it easy, but it is simple. Okay, so... We want to do what pleases Him. Those things that please Him are always the things that are best for us, and our motivation for doing it is love. But let me also add this on to what this law won't do for you, is it will not end all the problems in your life. You know, walking with Jesus in this freedom, this great freedom that we're talking about, this power of God's Holy Spirit, it doesn't mean that you're not ever going to have difficulties in your life because you do. Is there anybody here that ever has difficulty in their life? Okay, a couple of us do. All right. <laughs> Being a Christian doesn't mean it, you know it's all rainbows and puppy dogs. There's there's stuff that's going to happen in life, and it's not going to be fun. Jesus promised that we're going to have tribulation in this life. John chapter sixteen verse thirty three. In this world, you will have tribulation. He promises, but he also promised victory over it and through it. But be of good cheer. He says, "I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world." So what does that mean? That means that anything it is that you face, you can overcome it. Because He's in you, and He will enable you to overcome it, or to navigate through it. Even if He takes you through the valley of the shadow of death. That's so Psalm 23, 4. Even if He takes you through it, Lord, I don't want to go through that valley. Jesus says, no, we're going through that valley. Now, Lord, that's the valley of the shadow of death. Jesus says, I know. Lord, that's, that's a dangerous valley. You should not go. Jesus, no, come on. It's going to be okay. Go on with me. Come on. I'm your man. I'm with you. Never going to leave you. Never going to forsake you. Valley of the shadow of death, not that big of a deal. It's only a shadow of death, not death itself. Come on, let's go. It's going to be an adventure. Right? But along this path that we walk on, a path that the Lord has marked out for us, that's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, we can be sure that we're never going to encounter anything that He doesn't know about. Because if we're walking on a path that's been marked out for us, who marked it out? Jesus marked it out for us. That means He knows what's down that path. He knows what's around the next bend in the road. You can't see what's coming up in your life next, can you? You don't know what's going to happen. How many things have happened in your life that you never saw it coming from a thousand miles off? And all of a sudden it's like, where did that come from? That ever happened to you? Yeah. Who knew about that? Well, he knew about that. And he's prepared you and enabled you to navigate through it. He's never going to leave you. Never going to forsake you. This world is full of trouble, but you are full of the Holy Spirit of God. This world's full of trouble, but what are you filled with? Spirit of God, if you're a Christian this morning. Now, we do have a choice. We do have a choice. Before we know the Lord, we don't have a choice. We just do whatever our flesh tells us to do.
but filled with God's Spirit, we know what the law of the Spirit is, and we are empowered to obey, but we still have to make the choice daily, don't we? Because sometimes, let's be honest here, we don't always choose what is right. Do we? Hello? 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 Okay, thank you. A little response back is good. Look, we sang a couple of semi Pentecostal songs this morning. A little response is good. God doesn't force us to love Him. And He doesn't force us to obey Him. So, what is the alternative to this law of the Spirit? We have a choice. What's our alternative? Well, that's point number two it's the law of sin and death. This is, here's, here's door number two, the law of sin and death. That's verses two and three. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do, and then it was weak in the flesh, God did. I'm going to come back to that. Okay, verse two tells me I'm free from this law, the law of sin and death. I'm free from that. It can, uh, uh, it, it's, it's not the fault of the law because the law itself isn't a bad thing. It, it just can't do anything for me. Okay, so that's why it's called the law of sin and death. It, it, again, it's not that it's a bad law. We're talking about God's laws here. So it's, it's not a bad law. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 12 says it's not a bad law. It's just powerless. It can't help me. The law of freedom, the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ, that helps me, that enables me, that empowers me. The law of sin and death does not do that. Again, the, the speed limit sign, it can't make me slow down. Uh, it, it's powerless to make my foot any lighter on the pedal. But Jesus can make my foot lighter on the pedal. The sign can't. Now I might fear the consequence of being, well, you know what we say, you know, it's, it's, it's only against the law if you get caught, right? <laughs> the, the, the sign right. can't make me slow down. I might fear the consequence of it. And that's not a bad thing to fear. That's a good fear. But it can't make my foot any lighter, but Jesus can. He hasn't much lately, but he can. <laughs> now the penalty, again, might make me think, maybe <coughs> slow me down a little bit, but Jesus enables my heart to change and to want to do it because it's what he commands. So my motive then changes. But I can choose to disobey if I want. That's what Romans chapter 7 was about. You guys remember Romans chapter 7. All the, all the messages you can get on our website. You can get a, a CD from Kurt if you want to. They're on YouTube. But that's what Romans 7 was all about. That struggle of choosing between doing what I know is right and true and doing what I know is wrong. And what is right and true freedom? Freedom and liberty. Doing what I know is wrong. Bondage. Mm. Sin. Death. Okay. My flesh wants what it wants. But I want to follow my heart. But I just want to do it. That's my flesh. That's what my flesh wants to do. But instead I want to stop and say, Okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? Okay, so the law of sin and death. What can that law do for me? What can that law do for me? Okay, the law of sin and death, the 613 different commandments, starting with the Big Ten, what can that law do for me? Well, it can judge me and condemn me. That's what it does. It judges me and it condemns me. It defines sin. It tells me what a sin is. It identifies sin in my life. Just like the Apostle Paul was saying, I wouldn't have known what covetousness was unless the law would have said, do not covet. Then, all of a sudden, I realize there's covetousness in me. You know, that greedy desire to have what somebody else has. That's covetousness. If God wouldn't have identified it, I would have known what it was. But now that God has identified it, I see it within myself. And I know that that's wrong. I know that it's a sin. The law says it's a sin and there's a penalty to pay for violating God's laws because it says, do not covet. And if I covet, I violated God's law. And if I violated God's law, there's a penalty to pay for that. So what can the law do? It can identify the sin. It can show me the sin in my own life and it can condemn me for committing the sin. That's all that it can do. That's what it's supposed to do. That's what it's meant to do. 
God shows us in his law what we look like on the inside. When we read God's laws, we see those things like, oh, that's covetousness? That's what I'm feeling? That's what that is? And that's a violation of God's laws? Oh, ugh, ow, the God's laws show us what's on the inside. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, God's word tells us to rid ourselves of bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, we're told in God's word to put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language. Why would God's word tell us to get rid of those things? Because we're filled with those things. Now, it's not like we can say, oh, well, you know, yeah, that's, I don't have any of that stuff. Sure you do. Of course you do. Why, why did he say it in his word? It's because that's what we're filled with. Now he says, put that stuff off. God's law identifies that within us, and that is what God's law is identified with. Are what God's law is designed to do, to help us identify what's within us. Okay, what can that law not do? This law of sin and death, what can, can identify sin? It can judge me, it can condemn me, it can do all of those things, but what can it do? Sadly, the law, it can't change you. That law can't change you. That's what we see down in the latter portion of, uh, of verse 3. Uh, he says, for, for what the law could not do, and then it was weak through the flesh. See, the law doesn't give you any strength or any power to obey it. It just identifies, judges, and condemns. That's what, it, that's what it's designed. That's not bad. That's just what it's designed to do. The law can do all of that. Uh, it's powerless to save you. It's impersonal. So it can't show you mercy or grace. The law never says, oh, you've had a rough day. Oh, I'm sorry. That, you know, just take the evening off from the law. It's all right. The law never does that. God does that. God shows mercy. God shows grace. But the law never does. That's where Paul ends up in Romans chapter 7, verse 24, when he says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? When you see when God's law, God's word identifies what's within us, and we see what's within us, we see really what we're made of. And it's not real pretty. When we see that, you cry out, oh, I need somebody. I don't need a what. I don't need a something. I need a someone. I need a someone to save me, to deliver me. And that's what it is. And that is where things change. Things begin to change when you and I realize that we have violated God's laws, that there's a penalty to pay for that. Mm -hmm. And I need a Savior. God does this. Point number three is where God intervenes. And I love this. It's right in the middle of verse 3. What the law could not do, and then it was weak through the flesh, God did. I love that. Two incredibly important words, maybe two of the sweetest words that you'll ever see in Scripture. God did. God did. Why? Why? Why did God do it? Because you can't. You never could. You weren't designed to, so God did it for you. Oh, I love the sound of that. You've heard me say many, many times that God is the creator of all things, that he has made the rules by which the world is governed, and we are subject to those rules, and he will hold everyone responsible for our violations of those rules. But didn't I just say that I'm powerless to obey the law and could never do it even if I wanted to do it? And that is absolutely correct. I could never do what God commanded me to do, but follow along with this. God makes the rules and will hold us all accountable, right? If he does not enforce his own law, what kind of God is he? Well, he would be an unjust God. What kind of judge is it that hauls up a convicted murderer in front of the judge and the judge says, I'm in a good mood today, just forget the whole thing, go on. Convicted and murdered? Ah, no big deal. Just forget it. <laughs> what if God did that? He wouldn't be God at all, would he? And he certainly wouldn't be just. So God does something for us that we never could have conceived of. We never would have thought of this ourselves. 
We never, if, if you were designing a religion or making up a religion, you never would have come up with this. God manifests himself in this world as a man. Lives a complete life of obedience to his own laws. Then, in spite of his complete obedience, dies at the hands of sinful men. He voluntarily sacrifices himself to pay the price for your violations and my violations of his laws. And now, then, when we place our faith and trust in him for who he is and what he's done, we are saved. We are saved. Saved from having to pay that penalty ourselves. What that does is it maintains his righteousness. Because the penalties that are due have been paid. He doesn't leave them unpaid. They have been paid. But they've been paid by someone else. For you. For me. Because the only way to pay that for yourself is to be eternally separated from God. I don't want that. Do you want to be eternally separated from God? I don't. So then, Romans chapter 3, verse 26, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. <coughs> that now I can be right before God. Correct before God. Amen. Because of him. Because he bought and paid for my forgiveness. So then how do we walk? How do we walk then? Well, we walk here in verse 4 according to the Spirit. We walk according to the Spirit. There will be a governing principle in your life and you will live by it, but what will it be? The governing principle, the ruling authority of your life, what's it going to be? Are you going to be are, are you going to try to be a, a rule follower? Well, I'll just follow all the rules and then Jesus will be happy with me. Are you going to be a law keeper or do you just love Jesus with all of your heart? And because you love Jesus with all of your heart, you want to do those things that are pleasing to Him, which you know are the best things for you. Is that what you want? Is that going to be the governing influence of your life? Follow Him wherever He leads. Walk in a manner worthy of His name and enjoy all the enabling power to be the person that God has made you to be the person that He wants you. Let me close with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You want to be the person that God wants you to be, the person that He's designed you to be, the person that He has saved you to be. He's going to enable you to do it. And the power of His Holy Spirit, this law of life in Christ Jesus, will become the controlling influence of your life as we obey Him simply because we love Him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do love You. Although, Lord, I know that we love You imperfectly. Now, Lord, we pray once again for that great power that you have for us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've called us. To love you the best that we can with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love those around us as you love them and as you have loved us. Lord, we know that you have the power for us to do those things and we're just asking again. Lord, you say that we have not because we ask not. Well, we're asking. Empower us once again today, Lord, to be those people and to allow your Holy Spirit to be the governing influence in our life. In all the things that we think and say and do and don't think and don't say and don't do. Lord, be that governing influence in all that we do that we might please you. Be the people that you've called us to be. We ask for this, Lord. We know that you will deliver because we ask it from you in Jesus' name. Amen.